but yeah, what, what I like to start this out is like, how about like you just like, you know, give like a quick introduction about, well, not quick, however long you want, like talk about your background, who you are, um, and then we can kind of just take it from there, whatever. Yeah, sounds good. So I'm Varun and I've been working in the tech industry for three years now. So I graduated from the University of Michigan in 2018 with a computer science degree. I worked as a software engineer for a couple of years at Amazon. And then since then, I've made a couple of different career moves. I went to a medium-sized tech company doing more uh, post-sales engineering work. And now I'm at a SaaS startup doing technical account management. Got it, got it. So tell me a little about your Amazon experience. Like, what was that kind of like? Um, and like, you know, also like, what was the compensation, if you don't mind sharing a little bit about that? Yeah, so I worked as a software development engineer, level four at Amazon for uh, a little under two years. I did an internship with them. And then I spent just under two years with them full time. I worked at three different offices actually. So I interned in the Boston office. I started off full-time at the Seattle office. And then my last tenure there was in the Detroit office. I worked in the Alexa org, the AWS org, and the retail org respectively across those three offices. So I got a pretty good look at the company. And I also got to really feel out whether I wanted to be a software engineer forever, which the answer was no. <laughs> uh, and uh, the compensation was very good. Uh, Full-time, my compensation was 140K a year, which consisted of a base salary of 110. Um, and the remaining 30K was a mix of bonus and uh, stock options. I don't remember the exact breakdown. And this was like fresh off graduation, right? Like 2018? Correct. 19? Yes, 2018. 2018. Gotcha, gotcha. Wait, you worked in a retail section? I didn't know Amazon. You mean like the Amazon Go facilities? Uh, no, no. Retail refers to just the e-commerce, the oh, Amazon.com. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. gotcha. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. So were you on like a rotational program or something? Uh, no, but at Amazon, you can freely switch teams as much as you want so you can almost like create your own rotational program and i've seen a lot of people at amazon specifically do that so mm -hmm. um if you don't like your first team you can easily switch to a new one six months in if you want um, every team at amazon is always hiring so they're almost always willing to take new talent from another team at amazon i see i see so you're able to get into a fame company with to my knowledge, below 3.0 GPA, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. How did you make that happen? Because I know these companies are not necessarily notoriously known, but obviously they like hiring from like the best schools, the best candidates. And, you know, from my experience, I know GPA doesn't necessarily translate over to real life work experience or how well you perform a job. But in general, I'll still say companies value that pretty highly. So what is your story of how you're able to twist that and make it happen for you yeah so when i was recruiting in college uh there were a lot of companies that did care about gpa but thankfully the ones that did not were all these big prestigious tech companies so like the fang companies did not care and as long as you don't put it on your resume they are not even going to ask about it so once you get into the interview process and you get those coding interviews it's completely irrelevant no matter where you went to school. So if anyone watching this is uh, like has a lower GPA, I would say, don't even worry about it. Just don't put it on your resume and it's not gonna be a factor at all. That being said, if you did get very good grades, like a 4.0 at a prestigious school or whatnot, that can certainly help you. All right, all right. So would you say that's like so software engineering specific? Um, or you, you think that's like more general across the board as well? Your I, think it, opinion. I think it used to be software engineering specific, but from what I understand now, like five years later, I think that's changing across all job functions and even more companies are getting rid of their GPA requirements now just in the competitive labor market. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. That's true. Yeah. So you, you no longer work in big tech, 
right? You have now since then moved to a startup. Can you talk? Can you talk about like what startup you're working at and kind of what you do right now? Yeah, so I work for a startup called Notarize, and what they do is they help people get documents notarized online. So you can go on their website and do that on your own, but we also help companies that need to get thousands of these documents notarized. So like mortgage companies, auto refinancing companies, auto resellers, we also partner with them to help them automate things and help their customers get these documents notarized as part of their customer experience, right? So uh, I work as a technical account manager. And what I basically do is I'm a technical point of contact for our customers. So as they're kind of implementing our solutions and getting things automated, I'm here to help strategize with them um, what features they might want to use, what uh, functionality they want to take advantage of, advocate for them if they have any ideas for enhancements for new features, um, advocate for them in terms of getting them to test new unreleased features in a beta test. Um, so really just the technical champion for our customers. Mm -hmm. Mm, I see. I see. What what has kind of been like the biggest difference you've seen between like big tech and working like a startup? Yeah, I think the biggest difference between big tech and a startup is definitely that at a startup there is no process, no structure, and no red tape around anything. So this can be a good thing and a bad thing. So it can be a bad thing when you're wondering what the process is to get something done or get a question answered and it just doesn't exist. Uh, so it can be frustrating sometimes, but I think it's also really good if you want to get experience working cross-functionally because you will, if you have any ideas to get something done or do something better for the company or for customers, there's pretty much no one telling you no. Like you might not need anyone to sign off on that. You can go ahead and make that happen yourself. So that is probably my favorite part of working at a startup is that I can, I can do whatever I want, basically. Mm, gotcha. And then like was, I guess like what, what was kind of like your personal reasons of transitioning from big tech to startup? Like if you have any additional there. Yeah, I would definitely consider myself a career changer. So I knew I did not want to be a software engineer forever. And I wasn't able to make those moves happen at a big company because like I mentioned, there's lots of red tape and, and rules and processes to make those things happen. And it might take years to make a simple career move or try a new project. Whereas at a startup, you're going to be doing a lot of things outside your main job description. You get to try a lot of new skill sets out. If you want to help a new team on a project of theirs, you can easily go do that. And so I felt like it would be the best thing for me to achieve my goals. Mm. So I guess the question that begs is, do you think big tech is still worth doing in today's world? Or I guess the better question is, should someone out graduation go into big tech or go into startup? That's a great question. I mean, I would say if I had the opportunity to just join a startup right after graduation, I think I much rather would have done that. But doing big tech first makes getting a job infinitely easier. So having that experience, especially at Amazon, which kind of prides itself on being the world's biggest startup. I not only found it very easy to sell myself in interviews for new jobs, but I also felt very prepared going into the startup work environment. So to answer your question, yes, I almost would say it is worth it. And I got something out of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice, nice. So you think that you think the prestige that comes with big tech is still like a strong card to play? That's true. I mean, I, I, I yeah. go ahead. Yeah, I, I absolutely think it gives you a leg up in interviewing because when I interviewed for any type of job afterward, whether that was software engineering or anything else, I did not ever get my technical abilities questioned. It really like was an easy sell 
to get into the next stages of an interview process or even just get my resume looked at. So um, it does hold a lot of value. Yeah, yeah. I I think like one of the hardest things that I struggled with when I was trying to like, you know, apply for full-time jobs and stuff was that I, I didn't have a lot of strong names on a resume. So a lot of times people just start asking a bunch of technical questions. But once I got my first full-time job at Wells Fargo, right? Um, when I started applying for other banking jobs, like I, they, they never asked me any technical questions anymore because they just kind of assumed that I knew them, which is kind of a scary assumption if you ask me because a lot of times I'm just like, thank God you didn't ask me. I wouldn't know answer that right now. <laughs> but, yeah, I have really mixed feelings about technical questions. Like in college, I absolutely hated them. And even now, I think they're like, so I, dumb. I, think they're so I still, dumb. I still have very low patience with them. But if I'm looking back and if I had to hire a college student with no experience, I don't know what I would evaluate them. Yeah. On. Cause like they don't have like real work experience, right? Even internships. I think we all know like are very different from full-time class projects are obviously very different from full-time. So it's just so hard to like gauge will this be a productive member of my team? So um, I think that's kind of the only way we have to gauge that for college students. How, how, how relevant is like leak code or like just like, you know, coding questions and algorithms even relevant to like the job and like software engineering? I would say almost not at all, but I <laughs> see why they do it because leak code and like doing coding interviews it can help you gauge whether someone is good to work with. So I will say, I think the automated coding tests definitely don't say anything about a person's ability to work as a software engineer. The whiteboard interviews are a maybe because if you're working with someone and communicating your solution and thinking through it, um, that's definitely important stuff to know about a candidate. Now, does it need to be about like, computer science textbook concepts, I don't think it needs to be. I don't think that much studying should go into preparing for a job interview. And I do feel like there needs to be a way to gauge those skills without requiring someone to learn all this knowledge they're never going to apply. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's your opinion on coding boot camps? Rapid fire. Ask I think coding boot camps are excellent if you come from an extremely like non-tangential to tech industry so like if you were like a humanities major for example and you really want to get into tech like let's be honest this might be one of the only ways you could get your shot into it so like if you can afford the boot camp and you have the time to do one it's better than nothing i would say um if you already work in some corporate field though like if you already work in some type of like white collar job, finance, marketing, consulting, banking, whatever. Like, I don't know if it would be necessary because you probably have the skills already to land yourself a tech job. Um, By tech, you yeah. don't mean like software engineering, you mean like other types of roles within a tech company, right? Ah, uh, yeah, that's true. I think, yeah, if you, if you do specifically want to switch to software engineering, like, yeah. I don't know, like it might be one of the only ways unless you can afford a four year degree, but we all know how expensive that is. Yeah. So um, I know some yeah. people that get, get master degrees in CS. Like I have a friend right now, he's getting a master in CS and he, he did like finance for undergrad. Like, I, I don't know, I never heard of that, but I think that's like a- Yeah, yeah. Opinion. A master's is definitely another option. Definitely not a cheap option, but definitely an option. And I've seen people do that. Um, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it's it's hard. I can't really like speak to like the breaking into tech and the switching into tech side of things because I started in tech, you know. So yeah. it's like really hard for me to speak to like the all the different little shortcuts people find the, their way into, you know. Like I did a very traditional thing. I just got a CS degree, you know. <laughs> yeah. Was there is there like any other career paths that you have ever thought of? or are still considering right now? You mean for myself? Yeah, like anything. Yeah, definitely. Um, I eventually like don't really see myself working with clients every single day, although I do enjoy it right now. I think I would much rather move into some type of strategic role. So mm -hmm. 
I do really like working on the like partnership side of things and working with the customers. So something where I'm strategizing like how we partner with customers or how we communicate with customers or how we sell, like something where I get to be on a more tactical role and not so much like responding to client requests all the time, I think. Yeah. So I still need to figure out what that looks like. Yeah. How, 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 how about being a comedian, man? You ever thought about that? <laughs> <laughs> I've definitely Have thought you about content. That. that shit still makes me laugh. I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah. I've definitely thought about that. And the content thing is definitely a passion project. And I'm very open to seeing where that goes to. <laughs> I'm kind of running that in parallel, I would say. But um, I don't think I want to be like a stand up comedian, but I really, really do enjoy like making videos and making content. So no matter what I do in that space, I think I want it to stay within a content platform. Mm. Got it. Got it. All right. Let's talk about, let's talk about remote work. Cause I know good. you have an account dedicated to talking about remote work. So why, what's, so it's, I guess let's start us out. Like, why are you so big on remote work? What are the benefits of it? I'm bullish on remote work because it has freed up my mental bandwidth it's given me a lot more time to focus on things that matter to me and it has also improved my outlook on my own career so now that I don't have to worry about dumb things about like you know being at the office at a certain time for optics or like being in a certain corner of the office to be around certain people and things like that I can focus more on the work I am doing and doing good work and it's forced me to think about like what that is to me, like what, what I consider good work and my best work. So um, I think that, and then just like the freedom it has afforded me makes me very, very set on doing this for as long as I can. Yeah. Do you think it's feasible that companies can technically permanent remote or you feel like eventually it does make sense to have like maybe a hybrid system or just going back to where we were five days a week. Yeah, I think it's very feasible now. I mean, this is not just happening in the tech industry. This is happening in the healthcare industry. This is happening in consulting. This is happening even in finance and law. So many more companies are starting to offer that hybrid or that full remote flexibility. And if you truly want to stay remote, I think there has never been a better time to make that happen. So I do think it's feasible and you just have to be uh, aware of what opportunities there are out there and be willing to negotiate too, because some companies might not be willing to give you that remote flexibility at first, but if you show that you're capable of doing the job and can maybe sell that in an interview, they might be willing to give you more flexibility. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Definitely. Yeah, one thing I really liked about remote work was just like I was able to live at home, you know, save a lot of money. But yeah, I, I, I feel like me personally, I feel like a hybrid system is like the best because I, I kind of get bored at home. Not gonna lie, like yeah, I, I wake up every day, I go to I go to my room, go to my desktop. Like I kind of I kind of enjoy having that interactions once in a while, but not all the time. Like I don't I don't want to see my coworkers every day. Let's be honest, like fuck those guys, right? <laughs> I agree. And you but know two times what? a week, like, I, I wouldn't mind yeah. having that like, lo- like very PC lunch in which we talk yeah. about what the fuck we're going to do at the weekend. And actually, and yeah. pretty much don't give a shit about each other, but we have to make conversation for three minutes. Yeah, definitely. And I will say, like, if my office was like downstairs or just a short walk, like, yeah, I would definitely go like at yeah. least a couple times a week just to like say hello or whatever and get social interaction. But like, if it's, a long commute then like I don't know I would rather just be at home most of the time um, or just like work at a work remotely for a company in a different state like I would rather do that than sit in traffic like for an hour every day yeah did you one way. commute a long time to work because you're not, I would you're say in state, right when I was in you're Seattle, Seattle you're in Seattle so when I was in Seattle it was either like a 15 minute subway ride or like a 20 to 30 minute walk right so like not too bad but like 
enough to make me question like why I even need to be here. Like, cause there would be so many days where I commuted in and we're all just at our desks the whole day. Like I don't even have meetings and like, it didn't make a lot of sense to me. And then in Detroit, I drove about 20 minutes one way, which is again, not that bad. Some days it was worse, but that, and then the parking situation and all of that combined again, I would go in and just be sitting at my desk coding. And I'm like, I don't really need to be here. Like, but okay, I'll, I'll just do this because that's how things are done. And then yeah. when COVID rolled around, that's when I was kind of like, actually, like, that's dumb. Like, I don't want to do that anymore. Like, this is perfectly fine. Like, I fully adapted. And um, that's this is just what I do now. Do you think yeah. you ever go back to big tech? or not even big tech, like more of a corporate company? Because right now you're a startup and I know you enjoy that a lot. Like you ever thought about just, I don't know, down the line, you don't want to have like 10 things to do every day and stress you out. You just want to like work on one thing over and over again for five years. You ever thought about that? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I think the idea of that sounds really nice. Like being able to go back to like a bigger company and have that kind of cushy, kind of just stable consistent type of role where I get a paycheck or whatever um but at the same time if I think about why I would want that it would be like oh so I can spend time with my family or whatever but I think in my ideal world I'm just not working like I would rather just like be financially independent and you know focus on like fun projects throughout the day and then spend the rest of the time with my hypothetical family, you know? So like, um, yeah, I mean, if I needed to, sure, I'll go back to big tech and maybe get that cushy Google job or whatever. But like, um, I would much rather just not work. <laughs> so, yeah. No, you man, look into that career of being comedian, right? You, gotta, yeah. you, you, you want to talk about financial? Yeah, yeah. That's your, that's your ticket right there. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Like, <laughs> I, like my dream would be to just like, be financially independent and just Do talk make so make more. make stupid videos all day. You know that would be yeah. the dream. Yeah. Awesome. What what is I like to close this out by asking what is something or like advice you would give to your eighteen year old self if you were to time travel and meet him today? Yeah, I would tell my eighteen year old self to think more critically about what my passions and best skills are. I don't think I thought about those things enough. You know, I kind of just blindly declared a major that I kind of liked, but didn't really love. And, you know, that led to kind of needing to like make more changes later. And it, it's hard because you can't ever get it fully right. Like between 18 to 22, you have so many hard decisions to make, but I wish the decisions I did make were more based on my passions and my desires and not based on what I should do and what other people are doing. Yeah. And, and I think like from 1822, something I learned was just like every year is just such massive changes. Like the difference between a freshman and junior in college, it's like, we're talking about like, like the, the, the way to think about the world is so different. And from senior to exactly. like your first year in corporate, like, Oh, that's when your life changes a lot. You're like, Oh shit. Exactly. Four years of my life. What the fuck? Just yeah. <laughs> true true yeah no, that's, that's not a good advice it's like look back and really think about like okay am i just like falling to hurt or am i actually doing something that you know i kind of want to do which is kind of hard to like say to 18 year old because i feel like when we're 18 i don't know when i was 18 like i don't want to be a, i want to be a electrical engineer you know <laughs> you know and it was like yeah. it wasn't even like i was falling to hurt but i thought that was actually what i wanted to do because it was just yeah like, and i feel like college puts you in this like unfair like rushed mindset of like having to figure things out quickly because you have this four-year degree and then maybe like halfway through you might be like oh shit I don't actually enjoy this but I already took half of the classes so I got to finish this and then you finish it and then you get to the real world and you took the first job that that major led you to and for me like that was the first time where I was like okay what do I actually want to fucking do like uh, like what, how do I actually want to spend my time now? I just have all the time in the world. Like, and it's just wild to me that I didn't think like that until I turned 22, 23, like, 
Like, why are we not programming that into people's brains earlier? Like, yeah. um, and maybe a lot of that is just like coming from the immigrant household I grew up in, you know, like, and that mindset and how that impacted me. But like, um, yeah, I, I do wish I thought about those things earlier because I could have saved a lot of time. A lot of time, like in terms of, because I, I don't know, I, I don't think you will say you wasted time in your career necessarily, right? Like, no, I, I mean, like, it could have, like, I, I could have been at, like, I, I, I kind of, I don't know, man. I, I feel, <laughs> I know you what know you mean. What? It's like, you, you, you can probably like stress him out something, you know. You can probably relate to this, but for some reason, I like feel like I'm behind, even though I'm not, you know, and like, I, uh, behind, dude. Shit. Let, me, let me tell you about that <laughs> <laughs> i feel like i'm behind on like pursuing my passions like mm. i i i feel like i wish i did that earlier i knew people who did that earlier and they're like vibing right now like they're like at jobs they like or they're doing great at those jobs or they started their own thing and like i just see people like that and i'm like man like i i i feel like i'm in this mode where i'm like hopefully that'll come soon. Like, hopefully that'll come. Hopefully I'll like, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm, every year I get closer to that. You know, that's why I made these career moves. That's why I um, started doing TikTok too. Like I want to like spend more time doing things I'm passionate about, but like, yeah, sometimes I'm like, huh, I could have done that a lot earlier too. Like nothing's mu that much different right now. Like these are all things I've known I was passionate about, but just kind of didn't like act on until much later. Do you think your job can be your passion? This is something I often struggle with. It's like, can a job be a passion or don't mix, you know, work with pleasure? That's the age old question. I feel like you can't convince me that there's like a job title that's perfect for a person that they're super passionate about. Like, that's just not how like humans work. Like, like when, when a person tells me like, oh man, I'm like super passionate about like being a product manager or some bullshit like that. I'm like, well. Hey, uh, I know a person you're gonna piss off right now. <laughs> I, I think you can get, I, I think you have to go a level deeper than the job yeah. title. You have to like think about, okay, like let's use that as an example. So like as a, as a PM, like what are you doing? You're like working with people. You're like influencing a roadmap. You're like, um you're you're kind of trying to steer the ship or if you will right for a yeah, project yeah, launch like something, take something more good like i'm now learning that you can get a lot of that satisfaction out of like a lot of different jobs and a lot of different endeavors in life so like maybe that's like like i, I think that's where the passions are like that second level below the job title itself like yeah that person would be passionate about like if someone asked that person, why do you like being a PM? They'll be like, I am passionate about uh, working with people or some, something like that, you know, or I'm passionate about um, figuring out the solution and figuring out like, like the root of a problem, right? Like I think people might say something like that, but like, I don't think like you can just take a job title and make a blanket blanket statement and say like yeah that's my passion because like every job also has bad things too and that's why i have the issue there because like what are some of the bad things about being a pm um you have people bugging you every day for like a lot of dumb shit you have like leadership on your ass about things all the time um it's generally stressful in a lot of ways like who's passionate about that no one's passionate yeah. about that so um I don't know. I, I think I think you're I, right. I guess I guess I just have mixed feelings about it. Is my answer? Yeah. 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 No, but I think you're. I I just I like hundred percent agree with what you just said there. It's like no one is passionate about investment banking, right? But you yeah. can be passionate about making money, talking to clients, um, yeah, closing deals. You can be passionate about that, but I don't think anyone's passionate about like I don't fucking know like fucking working in excel or some shit like that like, yeah. I, I don't know maybe you are I, I could be wrong right it's maybe someone out there is i i obviously wasn't but i know what you mean it's like you're passionate about the satisfaction and certain job tasks that it brings with it but not mm -hmm. necessarily like the world itself like because it's just a role 
if that's all you're doing. But it's like, all right, great. Do you get to talk to people? Do you get to be a software engineer, which like a work revolves around critical thinking, logical thinking, um, and all that stuff. While, you know, being a software engineer, I'm pretty sure to say that there's still a lot of procedural stuff to do. You're still, you know, pushing things along. There's still a lot of corporate politics you have to deal with. But you can be yeah. about like, you know, the, the 20, 30, 50% time where you get, you get to be like a critical thinker and work with them. Yeah, like exactly. That sort. Exactly. Like software engineering is another great example. Like for me, like I was definitely not interested in like, some parts of it like sitting there and kind of like figuring out a new tool and like breaking it apart and playing around with it and like like figuring out the right technology to like accomplish some really really technical thing right like i was not really passionate about that but does that mean i hate coding not necessarily i don't even like hate the technical side of things that much it was just like this part of the job, which is unfortunately a big part of the job, like wasn't really it for me. I did not like the day to day of the job, like the journey of the job, right? Like, and now we're going on another tangent here, but like, I feel like a a big mistake that people make when they're like choosing a career is like when someone says, you know, I love being a software engineer because I just love that satisfaction when you like, you know, the code compiles and, you know, you you ship the code and that feels great. If that's your favorite part of the job, you're going to fucking hate this job, man. Because like after you do that, you're going to get another project and you're going to be sitting there for two months hating yourself until that next moment. Like you cannot be in this for the destination. You got to be in this for the journey. I was not in it for the journey. I hated the journey. Now, like in my current role, Like, it would be like someone saying like, oh, I just love when, you know, I, you know, respond to the email and like, I don't have to talk to the client anymore. Like, no, no, you have to enjoy like figuring out the customer's problem. You have to enjoy like jumping all over the company to answer a question for them. You have to enjoy figuring out a solution for them and understanding their pain points. Like that's stuff I actually enjoy. So yeah. I don't mind the day to day. I don't mind sifting through all the email. I don't mind like the wall to wall meetings on my calendar, like stuff that might stress someone out about the job. Like I tend to generally enjoy it. So um, yeah, yeah, it's all about the journey. Very cliche, but very true. No, I think that's true. And I actually feel like you just, you just actually answered something in my mind why I hated banking so much because you know, like the goal of banking is to close deals and to, you know, to have that satisfaction after you close a deal. But the journey you get to the closing a deal fucking sucks. For lack of a bad word. Yeah. Like you said, I fucking hate that journey. I hate the process. To be honest, the payoff wasn't even that great. When we finally close a deal, I didn't give a shit. I'll just yeah. go done with. And then here's the next one. Here's the next one. Yeah. Okay. Yep. You do it for another three, four months for to close it. And then, you know, great. Cool. Onto there were, you, you have to like that three month process of like going through it, done, going through it, done, going through it, done. Yeah. Another thing about software engineering was like the design reviews. So like when you're building a project, you got to design it and then you got to have the team review it, right? Like, have senior yeah. people kind of pick it apart and, you know, give you an opportunity to also get better at the job. Right. Um, I absolutely hated that. Like I would put these designs together and like, the senior engineers would be like, oh, did, did you think about doing it like this and how that would impact uh, the performance of that? And I'm like, no, I didn't think about that. I just want to end this meeting and I just want to go home and get high. Like, that's what I want to do. <laughs> okay. Like, that's what I want. So, yeah. yeah. I hope I hope I'm not being too vulgar on this call. <laughs> Please. No, trust me. I, I, okay. I, I, I mean, after we finished recording, actually, actually, like, I want to tell you something, but it's like, no, I, I don't mind at all. I don't mind at all. I, I curse okay. at videos once in a while, too. Like, okay. It, it doesn't okay. matter at all. No, this is great. Keep doing what you're doing. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I think it's funny you said that because I have a friend that works at Amazon. He kind of gives the exact same thing. And how he describes it, just like, every time you go to fucking design review, it, it turns into, like, a freaking ego battle of, like, just this different senior managers want to, like, 
one up each other be like yeah you know do you think about this and this and that it's like look how smart i am look how much i know and, and you're like oh, i've man. been there for a year i don't i didn't even know this existed at amazon like what the fuck are you talking about dude this exists at every company actually yeah, i think yeah. people I, I think people severely downplay this type of stuff i mean like like that's a big part of every SWE job is like the design reviews and like um, the same thing on my getting, banking too. It's the politics, you know. Yeah. Like, okay, you finish your pitch, yeah. like, you send it to senior manager, and then there's like multiple senior managers, and they're all like, "Oh yeah, we should do it this way." And you're like, why, why does that matter? Why, why is that yeah, matter? I don't give a fuck, man. I <laughs> yeah. I give zero fucks. Like, <laughs> let me go home, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Anyways. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Anna, I am pretty much. That's kind of all. Everything I have. Anything else you want to add? Like I don't know. I can just like fucking throw some snips in at the end if you want. Just like yeah. Um, I don't know. We we were onto something good. We were onto something good. We were onto something um, really good. Yeah. I mean, I mean, like I, I think I think like one of the biggest problem with like corporate and politics is that in a day like I think. I mean, this is, this could, I could be going off a complete different tangent right now, but I think people always say like in the workplace, you want to keep it professional. Don't bring like your personal baggage or personal opinions into the workplace. But I think that's complete horseshit, dude. Anyone, I think in, I think in college we were taught like be professional in the workplace and I, yes, be professional, but if, if I'm being like very nuanced here, but if you know what I mean, it's like personal shit, egos, personalities, that is the one thing that no one taught you how to deal with and how to work through like in the corporate world right it's like yes people are being professional but you got to see the intent behind the voice the intent behind the smile right what are they actually saying here all right because if you don't you know you can you can you can piss off someone very quickly yeah yeah I, that's another that's actually one thing <laughs> I, just, I just went out a different route no. right this is another thing I like about startups is that that stuff is less prominent. Like most people are just themselves and like most people, yes, there's politics that do come up, but like there's less well, layers to it. There's definitely less layers. I am generally like, I feel like the most myself I've ever been at a job. Like I, um, I never feel like I have to be that careful with my words. Like, and we're, we're all just like, all right, like we're getting shit done. You know, we're just trying to get this shit done. You know, like we're all busy, like no real, there, there's only really one agenda here and that's to like secure another round of funding, you know, or go, or go public. So like, you know, let's just all do a good job. You know, I think once the company goes public and grows a lot, like then it becomes more like, oh, this department VP has that agenda that conflicts with that VP's agenda and though like all this drama starts like what is your yeah. company right now you, you, it's like how big a thousand people or no it's like 450 oh, or yeah, so nice. maybe 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 we hit 500 recently mm -hmm. um yeah we we hire a lot of people but then like people leave too and stuff so yeah we're right around 450 to 500 yeah do they do brand deals <laughs> I don't think so. And even if they did, I don't even know how that would work. We are not even that, we're not even there yet, I would say. Like, you, you, can, you can be the face of Miller Rice. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Oh, man. I don't, I don't want to be. I don't want to be. No, I don't want to be. <laughs> Give like a nice extra fat bonus at the end of the year or something like that. I, 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 I thought about that, but I'm like, dude, I don't think the market for this is on like, social media or like tiktok really or maybe maybe it is i don't it's know to be it's not it's not really like a b2c this is this is such a new space like like i don't even know like maybe the market is somewhere on tiktok deep in the tiktok algorithm maybe yeah. there's a notar notarization uh crowd <laughs> yeah i mean i mean like, i don't know business owners right like yeah, the, business the only reason owners, I yeah. ever used Notarize was because I was trying to start my, you know, proprietorship and I needed okay. to file a DBA. And I was oh. like, what the fuck is Notarize even mean? So and they're like, oh, we can yeah, just yeah. paid in 25 bucks, Notarize.com. So I ended up hopping on the freaking webcam call from Trick from Dallas. I'm just like, yeah, yeah. Why are you here? What are we doing here? So like, I, I just need to watch you. And then we'll go yeah, they just watch you sign a document. Yeah, make sure you're <laughs> real. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
like, cool. <laughs> That's <laughs> that awesome. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what, what's kind of like your, your, your short-term plans for now? I, I know you're trying to move to New York. Like, why, why did you talk a little about that? Yeah, I'm hoping to move this summer. Um, ideally, July or August by the time my lease is up here. Um, I have a lot of trips coming up. So I have one next week. I uh, have like weddings coming up and other travel work trip coming up. So it's going to be a busy few months of traveling. Um, besides that, I'm very, very committed to hopefully getting on YouTube very soon. So I can honestly talk about a lot of things we talked about today or even other personal topics just in much greater detail, essentially. Yeah, subscribe to um, YouTube channel. What's up? Subscribe to his YouTube channel, guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I... Other than that, no other real, like, short-term goals. I'm just trying to... You know, oh, man. you know, enjoy my enjoy my life and keep uh, hopefully make some progress building this content stuff on the side too. You know, it's hard to balance it all, as you probably know. Yeah, no, it's 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 tough. Like those videos that you record, I'm like, first of all, you have to write the script for that. Yeah, you know, like I can do it. Like <laughs> you, you gotta get out of bed, record yourself, and then get back into bed, record yourself getting out of bed. <laughs> yeah, like when I started, like my last job my hours were so chill that like I had I was just doing these videos while I was working and like I was able to just pump out so many videos and then um yeah now I am like a little bit deeper in the corporate shit right now so I haven't had that freedom but also like been kind of thinking of re-strategizing a little bit so mm-hmm. um uh so yeah like if you're going to put in all that effort to like write a video and and film it and all that stuff like I want to be more intentional about it now like so like getting on YouTube for example like we all know that that's a lot of work like a lot more work than TikTok for sure so like I've been I've been spending time just thinking about like okay if I'm gonna do that if I'm gonna invest all that time and money up front like I want to make sure I like ha- I approach it strategically and make sure I make the most out of it and not just like this is going to be a hobby that I'll just pass within a month you know mm-hmm. yeah because I do want I do envision to like build it into something you know so yeah no, I agree that, that's kind of been stopping me as well it's like if I start I want to start and keep going not just start and be like yeah I post a yeah. few months later. It's like, no, I want to make it to a good week. We are at least a bi-weekly thing, but I got to get yes. the right mindset and like space out time in my calendar to make sure that I have time to film every single week. Yes. Like, how yeah. can I do this in a sustainable way that I won't burn yeah. out and I can just like commit to like a cadence where like I put up a video and like I can go back to my life like and not like have to worry about. I, I see a lot of these creators like on YouTube, especially who say like, after their nine to five job, they would every single day, they would try to put up a video every day and they would like, you know, work on the video from like 5 p.m. to 2 a.m. or something. And I just don't see myself doing that. Like no. I'm ideally thinking like I could like make a video on like a Saturday, crank it out and then go back to enjoying my weekend, you know, and just do like one video a week, maybe. Yeah. So it's hard. Yeah. Man. It's hard. I, hard. I, I have so much more respect. Like you said, like so much more respect for content creators now. It's, yeah. It's a lot of work. 